Hey guys, it's Jen. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another video. Now I know Christmas is over uh, for this year anyway, but I wanted to share my recipes and some footage from my holiday baking. So this year I made Crispix mix, some scotcheroos, some sugar cookies uh, with frosting. I also made some sponge candy, some citrus butter cookies, peanut butter balls, Oreo truffles, and some chocolate covered pretzels. So what I'm going to show you first is all of the groceries that I got to um, make all of these treats. And then I will go into the footage of what I baked and show you how I made everything. Okay, so here's everything I got for baking. I have some stuff on hand already, um, but this should be the majority of what we're gonna use. So I did already have some almond bark on hand. I had two um, packages in the pantry and then I picked these up at Fairway the other day. So I have three of the regular chocolate and four of the vanilla. I wanted to pick it up early because sometimes they run out of stock and I need this for the pretzels and the Oreo truffles and the peanut butter balls. Um, two jars of peanut butter, one is honey and one is regular but those will be for the scotcheroos and the peanut butter balls i got 18 eggs um, another package of regular sugar another package of powdered sugar i have some of this already in the pantry but my sugar cookie recipe uses powdered sugar as well as the frosting and then i got some um, regular all-purpose flour some oreos for the oreo truffles um, usually at christmas i like to restock my baking soda and baking powder so I just throw out what's left of the old one and use these so that I know that they're fresh. I got some Worcestershire sauce for the Chex Mix and some um, dark corn syrup for the Scotcheroos. Um, I got five pounds of butter so hopefully that's enough. I think it probably will be. A two pack of cream cheese and then for the citrus butter cookies uh, three oranges, two limes, and two or two limes and two lemons. And then for the cereal mix, the recipe I'm using has these Quaker oatmeal squares in there, so it has that, Crispix, and Cheez Its. And then the special K is for the Scotcheroos. And then obviously I got some pretzels for um, to dip in the white chocolate. And then I just got some of these treat bags for the Chex Mix, and then. Um, some plates, so some Santa plates. These are good if you want to pass out cookies and stuff. Just put it on there and stick it in a gallon Ziploc bag. And then some of these square paper plates. These also fit in a gallon Ziploc bag so we can um, give out treats with those too. So that is everything I got. I think I'm going to get started on the Chex Mix first. All right, so I said Chex Mix, but actually this is Crispix Mix, and I've had this recipe for probably about 15 years now. I actually got it from a coworker um, a long, long time ago, but uh, this is a little bit different than the normal um, Chex Mix or Crispix Mix because it uses the Quaker oatmeal squares, which is what you saw me putting in there first. So I put in six cups of those, six cups of Crispix, and then I'm putting in six cups of Cheez-Its. You could substitute um, pretzels or like, uh, what are those called? Oyster crackers or anything else that you want, but this is the combination that I use and it always works out really well. You also want uh, two sticks of melted butter and then you will mix in some seasoned salt, some garlic powder, and some Worcestershire sauce. So I will type the exact recipe out in the description box below, but it's really good. I would totally recommend it. After the butter and seasonings are all mixed together, just pour those down over the cereal and the crackers and mix it really well. You'll want a really large oven safe um, baking pan for this. It definitely won't fit in a nine by 13 pan. You'll want something larger. So these roasting pans that I have work out great. 
Once that is all mixed up, you will pop it into the oven. Uh, this will bake at 250 degrees for one hour, and you're actually going to set your timer for every 15 minutes. And every 15 minutes, you will remove the pan and stir the mixture around just to make sure that all the pieces are getting crisp and being coated evenly um, with the butter. So I'll pop that back in the oven and finish baking it. This is what it looks like when it's done. Once it's cool, you can transfer it to an airtight container or individual treat bags or Ziploc bags. This makes a ton, but it is really good. Um, and it will stay for about a week um, wrapped up tight. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to make are called scotcheroos. So I'm not sure, but I believe this is actually kind of a Midwest recipe. Uh, when I was a kid, actually, my uh, parents used to make them, and we called them Special K bars, and we always made them with Special K cereal. But I know that some people make them with Rice Krispies, so I think either will work, but I really do prefer it with the Special K. So you'll need six cups of regular Special K cereal. Um, these are similar to Rice Krispie Treats, except they taste like peanut butter. So personally, I think they're even better. And you top them with chocolate. Um, to make the peanut butter mixture, uh, you will combine some white caro syrup, one cup of that, and then one cup of sugar in a heavy bottomed pot. I like to use a big pot because I end up pouring my cereal right into there and mixing it all around before I turn it out into the pan. So just a tip there if you want to do that as well. Um, you don't have to cook this to a certain temperature basically you just want to cook the sugar and the corn syrup together until all the sugar is dissolved and it is bubbling just make sure you don't burn it and then once that is um, done cooking and kind of combining together you can add the peanut butter so three quarters of a cup I didn't measure this I may have used closer to a cup not sure it doesn't hurt it obviously if there's a little bit more peanut butter in there you can then turn off the heat and just stir it together until all of the peanut butter is melted into that mixture <music> Next, you can stir in your cereal. Just make sure that you are kind of stirring it in a folding motion. That way you don't um, crush, uh, or you try not to crush as much of the cereal as you can. So this is something that will really stick to the bottom of your pan. What I like to do is spray my pan with cooking spray, line it with parchment paper, and then spray it again before I pack my cereal mixture in. I'm gonna end up popping this whole kind of tray out of my baking dish so that I can cut these up and pack them up individually for people. Um, so once I get the cereal mixture in there, I just use another piece of parchment paper to push down and make it kind of a solid block. The same thing works if you're making Rice Krispie treats. For the top of this, there is kind of like a chocolate frosting that goes on top. To make that, you'll need half a bag of semi-sweet chocolate chips and half a bag of butterscotch chips. You can nuke these in the microwave at 30 second intervals until they are um, hot enough to melt. You, If you've never done this before, just keep doing 30 second increments and stirring it. I only think I actually had to do it for a minute before I was able to stir everything together. If you do it too much, you will burn the chocolate and then you'll have to start all over. So for that chocolate mixture, you can just go ahead and pour it over the scotch or ruse and then spread it around with the back of your spoon until the mixture is, or until the top is smooth and just try to distribute it as evenly as you can. That's basically it. Um, these just sit at room temperature until the chocolate hardens up and once everything is nice and solid, you can go ahead and cut them up. So the easiest way to cut these up, I think, is just like I said, pop them out of your baking dish and use your chef's knife to cut them up. They are a little bit hard and chewy. They're still obviously really good. They're just kind of hard to cut. So I'm just using my chef's knife to cut them into individual squares, and then I can pack those up into treat bags or on cookie trays to pass out. 
All right, so the next thing that I'm gonna show you guys how to make is my sugar cookie recipe. I've been using this recipe for years and years. They make the best cut out sugar cookies, in my opinion, um, to be able to roll them out. My kids love helping, and then I'll show you my frosting recipe as well that we use to decorate them. So if I can find this recipe still online, I'll link it down below, otherwise I'll type it out but for the dough you'll need one cup of butter and I'm doubling this recipe because I wanted to make a larger batch of cookies um, also there is no granulated sugar in this recipe which I think actually makes it like a less sweet and more tender cookie um, but basically the ingredients for the dough are butter powdered sugar egg almond extract, vanilla, salt, and flour. That's it. So Connor wanted to help me crack the eggs. He loves cracking eggs. He still needs a little bit of practice, but obviously he's only six, so <laughs> we have to be patient with him. But um, he's going to go ahead and crack the um, eggs into a little bowl. I always like to do that first, especially if kids are helping me. That way, if there is a shell in it, we can scoop the shell out before we put it in with the dough. So we're just going to get the rest of these wet ingredients mixed up together. I'll scrape down the sides and then add my flour. All right, wait for it. I'm putting in some flour and I'm telling Connor to put it on low and boom, he turns it up too high and flour flour goes everywhere so he actually felt pretty bad but I told him it was fine happens to the best of us so obviously you want to keep your mixer on low while you're adding all of your flour in once all of the flour is into the dough you can turn it up a little bit higher and just beat it for a couple seconds to let everything combine together once your dough is all combined you can turn it out of your mixing bowl onto a floured work surface and you have to chill this dough for about 30 to 60 minutes before you roll it out if you try to roll it out now it's just it's too sticky um, since you, you know the butter softened and everything it needs to chill a little bit before, before you'll be able to cut it out into shapes so i'm just kind of kneading it just a little bit to make sure that everything is well combined. I just basically floured my butcher block counter um, and I will basically just shape this into like a little um, loaf of dough and wrap it in saran wrap and place it in the refrigerator to chill. Okay, so cut out sugar cookies are definitely one of the kids' favorite Christmas activities. They beg me all year to do it, so there's no way I can get out of it. Um, I have some uh, children's size rolling pins that I got off Amazon a long time ago. I'll see if I can find them still and link them down below. They are really manageable for little kids, and if you're going to be making cookies, I would definitely recommend them. So I gave them each a little bit of dough and some flour, and so they're going to roll their own dough out and cut out the shapes that I want. When I place them on the cookie sheet, I'm going to try to keep them separate. That way they can each kind of decorate their own cookies. So they're going to get finished uh, cutting these out, and then I'll show you some of mine. Okay, so I'm going to do the same thing uh, with my cookie dough. So just take some flour and roll it on your, or sprinkle it, sorry, on your work surface and put your dough down. You want to make sure that you also sprinkle the top of your dough with flour and dust your rolling pin with flour as well. Um, I cut these out not super thin. Um, you want them to have a little bit of thickness so that they will be sturdy enough to frost. So not so thin that they'll break, but not so thick that they'll have a hard time cooking in the oven. Um, one of my favorite things in my kitchen is all of my cookie cutters. I've just collected them over the years and I have some like from my mom and my grandma as well. So it always just super nostalgic for me when I make cookies like this. So with the leftover dough, you can just do the same thing. 
roll it back out and cut out your cookies. And then I like to place these on a parchment lined baking sheet. Um, I like to use the parchment because I think it keeps the cookies from browning too much on the bottom. So there are my cookies all cut out ready to go in the oven and there are the kids. They actually did a really good job. I was actually super impressed. I think each year we do it, they get better and better. So you'll bake these cookies in the oven at 375 degrees for eight to 10 minutes. Um, they should be really lightly brown on the bottom, but not brown on the top. Don't over bake them. Once they are a little bit cooled on the sheet, you can just remove them to a wire rack and let them cool the rest of the way. You wanna make sure they are completely cool before you frost them. All right, so for the recipe I use for my sugar cookie frosting, this is actually considered a royal icing recipe. So the ingredients for this are powdered sugar, uh, meringue powder, and water. That's it. I can find meringue powder at Joanne Craft Store. I think you can also find it at Michael's. You may be able to find it at Walmart. I'm not sure. I'll find it um, on Amazon too and link it down below just in case um, you can't find it locally. But it's basically dried egg whites. So, you know, alternatively, there are recipes that use actual egg whites. I think the um, meringue powder is super convenient. And so what you'll do is just beat your powdered sugar and meringue powder with about five tablespoons of water. Again, I'll link this recipe down below or type it out. And this is just a preference on what consistency that you want for your frosting. So when you originally start beating it together, you will have to beat it for about seven to 10 minutes for it to get the volume that you need. This is why a stand mixer is really nice for this. But once it has a spreadable consistency, um, you can start coloring it with whatever food color that you want. Um, I would recommend gel food coloring. So again, you can get this at Walmart, Joanne Crafts, basically anywhere that has baking supplies. So it's just a lot, um, stronger than regular like drop food coloring and it gives like brighter colors so that's why i uh, like to use it but another thing i wanted to mention before i forget is with the consistency of the frosting you can just keep adding either water or powdered sugar so water to thin it out or powdered sugar to thicken it up as you're beating it um, you know you could make this thick and put it in a piping bag and then you could thin some out with water so you could do like the pooling technique that some people do with sugar cookies. I've done that before, but when I'm doing it with my kids, I just like to make it to a spreadable consistency because it's easier for them just to use like a butter knife to spread it on their cookies. So I think I made like four different colors. I made like yellow, green, blue, and then I kept some white. And then also I had a couple bags of just the squeezable frosting that I got at the grocery store. I think I had red and green and maybe yellow. I can't remember. So um, just basic colors, but enough variety to make sure that we had enough colors for our cookies. All right, so here is the aftermath after we got done decorating. You can see that I pulled out all of these sprinkles. I got some M&Ms out. We had some candies left over from when we decorated gingerbread houses. I also had some candy eyeballs. So this is obviously the most fun part, especially for kids. I will give you a tip. Have your kids decorate their cookies on like a rimmed baking sheet. It just makes cleanup a lot easier. Here are the ones that I decorated. This is always super fun for me too. Um, it's just fun to see what combinations of frosting and sprinkles you can come up with. So the next recipe that I'm going to get started on is actually an old family recipe from my grandma on my dad's side. Um, she used to make this when I was a kid. I remember it like really fondly and it's called sponge candy. So you will need a candy thermometer for this recipe. Um, basically you will cook together some white sugar and some dark corn syrup until it is at um, 300 degrees. And then you will add baking soda, vinegar, and a little bit of vanilla. So um, obviously when you mix baking soda and vinegar together, it foams up. And so that's what gives this candy its light and airy texture. And then um, after it's cool, you'll break it into pieces and dip it in chocolate. So I would be super curious to see if any of you guys have ever heard of sponge candy or if you've ever had it. I haven't talked to a lot of people that have actually had it or heard of it. I don't know if it's a Midwest thing, but I would be really curious to see 
um, what your experience has been with it. So I have a candy thermometer just clipped onto the side of my pot. You wanna make sure that your candy thermometer is not touching the bottom of your pan, um, just that it's submerged in the candy liquid. If it's touching the bottom of the pan, you won't get the correct temperature read. So once your candy mixture gets to 300 degrees, you'll just wanna stir it like semi-frequently so that it doesn't burn or stick to the bottom. Um, I mix together some baking soda with some um, vanilla kind of just to dissolve it and then you'll add the vinegar and the vanilla baking soda mixture and you'll see here when I do that it kind of like foams up and bubbles up. I'll go ahead and type this recipe out in the description box below. I don't have a link to it. Obviously this is like an old family recipe so it's like written out by my mom on a um, an index card, but this is like the texture it should be after it kind of foams up. I am pouring it out onto a rimmed baking sheet lined with a silicone liner. Um, really important, you wanna just pour this out. You do not want to spread it. If you spread it, you'll like smash the bubbles in the candy. So just kind of tap it a little bit and shake it out to get it to spread. And this will take maybe an hour, hour and a half to harden. And once it's hard, you can just pull it off and break it into chunks. So um, I don't know really how to explain the taste of this. It, it sort of kind of tastes like a Butterfinger, I think, because the inside is like, um, I don't know, sort of like light and crispy, but then it's dipped in chocolate on the outside. So. Um, yeah, I, this is just a Christmas tradition, something that I make every single year um, and everyone loves it. So for the chocolate coating, I like to dip mine in chocolate almond bark. Um, this just makes it easy. You can get it right in the grocery store. I just break it up into large chunks and put it in the microwave for 30 second intervals, stir it up until it is nice and melted. You will want some wax paper to lay your candy on after you dip it. So once the chocolate is all uh, melted, just stir it up to combine and then you can start dipping your candy. So the easiest way to dip candy, I think, is just by using a regular fork. So I just like throw the sponge candy down into the chocolate and then I sort of use my fork to hold it and tap off the excess into the um, dish with the rest of the chocolate. You can see me kind of tapping it on the edge there. So that's usually how I dip mine. I know that there are different methods out there and I think there's actually like chocolate forks that you can get to dip things, but this works just fine for me. So this is what I do. Um, I will just go ahead and dip all of these chocolates and get them out onto the wax paper. This doesn't take a super long time to harden, but once they are all hardened, you can take them off of the baking sheet and wrap them up. Um, you can see here is what they look like after they are hardened. Super delicious. Uh, and then there are some that I just dipped, but this is like a really unique candy. Uh, if you make this, everyone will be super impressed and it is really good. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna get started on, this is a Pioneer Woman recipe for citrus butter cookies. So I haven't actually made these before this year, but I saw this recipe, I can't remember if I saw it on Facebook or Pinterest, but I was like, you know what? This sounds really good. I love anything like citrus or lemon flavored. Um, Adam isn't crazy about it, but I figured I was making so many different things that it would be nice to have something non-chocolate, sort of like a, like, you know, a reprieve from all the chocolate that I'm going to include in these um, ca candy and cookie trays. But uh, for this recipe, the dough is basically like a butter cookie or a sugar cookie dough. So you'll need some softened butter, um, some lemon, lime, and orange zest, and then you'll beat the butter together with sugar. There's also eggs and flour um, in the dough recipe as well as some lemon, lime, and orange juice as well. If you don't have a microplane grater, I would definitely recommend getting one. I've had mine for years and years and years. I think I actually got it before we got married, um, but you can get them on Amazon. I'll link mine down below. Uh, they're super convenient if you cook a lot. Obviously, you, you know, you're gonna come into recipes where you need citrus zest, and so um, it's super helpful for that. You can also grate chocolate or like Parmesan cheese with it are just some of the other things that I use it for. So 
So one thing I wanted to mention with this recipe is actually um, the dough recipe for the cookies uses the yolks of the egg and then the frosting recipe actually uses the whites of the egg. So when you separate your eggs, make sure that you save the whites for the frosting. Now I'm just adding in some more citrus juice along with my flour and I will combine this until it forms into a dough and then I can make my cookies. So I'm trying to remember where I got this huge sheet pan from um, and I can't remember. I can't remember if I found it at the store or if I ordered it online, but I'll try to find one on Amazon and link it down below. It's like twice the size of a large cookie sheet, which is awesome when you're doing Christmas baking like this. Um, it's just nice to be able to take it all out in one tray. But for these cookies, uh, you'll just need like a small um, cookie scoop. If you didn't have that, you could definitely roll them into balls, but I think the scoop is just so much nicer. I'll find one and link it down below as well. Um, these aren't going to spread out a ton, so you'll want to leave some space in between them, but you can place them fairly close together. So I'll just get finished um, putting those on my cookie sheet and get them into the oven. These are going to bake at 350 degrees for about 13 to 15 minutes. Um, and then while that's baking, you can go ahead and work on the icing. So for the icing, you'll need, again, the egg whites that you saved, some powdered sugar, uh, a couple tablespoons of milk or half and half, and then lime, or I'm sorry, orange, lemon, and lime zest, as well as lime and lemon juice and a dash of salt. So I just used a whisk and whisked all these ingredients together in uh, a bowl. It worked just fine. I don't think you need a mixer for this. Again, here's that microplane I was talking about. I'm not measuring the zest out for the frosting. I'm just kind of grating it right over the bowl. So once that is all mixed up and combined together, you can just set it to uh, the side to wait for your cookies. You want it just a consistency that you can and drizzle it easily over the cookies. So now these are done. I'm just taking them out of the oven. I'm sorry, taking them off the baking sheet once they've had a chance to cool a little bit and putting them on some wire racks. Um, when I drizzle cookies like this, I always make sure to put some wax paper under my wire racks so that when I'm drizzling the icing on top of the cookies that I'm not making a huge mess on my counter. So here's my icing. I'm going to just drizzle it lightly in some lines over the cookies. Uh, don't be shy with the icing because the cookies themselves are not super sweet, but the icing is. And so you want to make sure that you get enough of that on there to taste it. Uh, after you put the icing on before it hardens, um, just again, grate some lemon zest over it. These turned out really, really good. I would definitely make them again. I don't necessarily consider them like a Christmas cookie, but again, I just thought it would be nice to have something in my cookie trays that wasn't uh, chocolate. All right, so here are my citrus butter cookies all done. I will just let the icing stiffen up before I pack them up into my cookie trays. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna show you guys is a recipe for peanut butter balls. Now you have to let me know in the comments. I believe some people call these Buckeyes. They're basically um, peanut butter candy dipped in chocolate. They kind of taste like a Reese's cup. But when I was growing up, my mom used to make these always for Christmas, and we always just called them peanut butter balls. We never called them Buckeyes. So uh, let me know below if you've had these before and what you call them. I think calling them Buckeyes is maybe a Midwest thing. I'm not sure. So uh, for this recipe, I'll link it down below. You will need powdered sugar, peanut butter, and softened butter for the peanut butter mixture. And then you'll need just some regular chocolate almond bark to dip them in. You could probably use white chocolate almond bark, but I always use the regular chocolate. That's what I like best. So once the peanut butter mixture is all combined, I use a stand mixer. You can roll these into balls and put them on a cookie sheet that is lined with wax paper. You will want to um, put these in the freezer for probably about 30 minutes before you dip them in the chocolate. If you try to do it now, they're too soft and the chocolate's hot and they will just melt all over the place. So thankfully uh, I live in the Midwest and it is very cold here right now. So I actually am using my garage 
to chill my baked goods. You can see there that I have some things on top of my SUV just chilling out and some uh, white dipped pretzels too, which I'll show you the um, those later. But yeah, I use my garage a lot in the winter to keep food cold. So uh, for this, I just have some of that chocolate almond bark that I melted in the microwave and I'm going to use the same method to dip these. So using the fork, just um, put the peanut butter ball in the chocolate and then tap it on the edge of the cup to let the excess chocolate drip off. Now, when my mom used to make these as a kid, I don't ever remember her putting sprinkles on them, but when I started making them as an adult, I usually made them for Christmas, and I always just think they look a little bit more festive with some red and green sprinkles on top. So that's what I do. Um, obviously, that part is optional, or you could put different colors on there if you were making them for like a birthday or a holiday or something like that. So I'm just going to finish uh, dipping these and sprinkling them and putting them back on the tray to harden. All right, so here are my peanut butter balls all hardened up. I'm just going to pack those in some containers to give out to friends and family. Okay, so the next thing that I am making is something I make every Christmas. These are called Oreo truffles, and the recipe is super easy. You definitely will need a food processor if you're going to make these. I know not everyone has a food processor. If you cook a lot, I think it's a really good investment for your kitchen. Actually, last year, Adam got me a Cuisinart food processor, which is something that I've been wanting for a really long time, and I really love it. If you buy one of these, you'll never need to buy another one again. So... Um, basically the inside of these all it is is just crushed up Oreos and um, cream cheese that's it oh and vanilla extract so I just put about 36 Oreo cookies into the food processor you can leave the cream in and everything and then you also need eight ounces of cream cheese so that's one block of cream cheese make sure it's a little bit soft before you put it in there and then uh, half a teaspoon of vanilla extract so you can put the lid back on and just basically combine that until it uh, forms into a ball and then you will roll it into balls and let that chill before you dip them in white chocolate Okay, so actually I misspoke there. You will wanna chill this mixture prior to forming it into the truffles. So if you try to do it um, right after you make it, the mixture will be too soft. So I just stuck my food processor uh, container out in the garage for about an hour before I rolled these um, into balls. And same thing, you'll just roll them and put them on a cookie sheet that is lined with wax paper. And then I am using white uh, almond bark to dip these. You could definitely use um, regular chocolate almond bark but I prefer the flavor of the white almond bark with these Oreo truffles so that's just preference there again I've melted this the same way just in the microwave in 30 second intervals and I'm using the same method to dip these with the fork and then I will also sprinkle some uh, sprinkles on them as well before the chocolate hardens <music> So Connor wanted to help me here with the sprinkles and you can see I kept telling him to like hold the sprinkle container up higher because he kept like dumping the sprinkles container like right into the chocolate which is funny you know kids they don't really have the dexterity to do all this stuff quite yet so um, either way it was cute he wanted to help me um, and so I let them you know even though it kind of makes a mess so we used some cookie crumbs for some of them and some green sprinkles and then I had some of these gold and white sprinkles that I got from Walmart which were also really pretty so uh, the last thing that I'm going to make is just some chocolate dipped pretzels I know that you can buy these um, but since I'm melting a bunch of chocolate anyway, it's just something easy to make and you can make them festive with sprinkles or you could even 
um, crush up candy canes and put them on top. That's really good too. So I'm going to go ahead and make a batch of these. Chocolate covered pretzels are one of my favorite, favorite things. The easiest ones I think to dip are these large pretzel twists or even easier actually like the long pretzel rods where you can just like dip them into the chocolate. But these are pretty easy too. So I ended up making two trays of these um, and putting sprinkles on those and letting them harden up before I pack them up too. All right, guys, so this is the last thing that I am going to be making for my holiday baking extravaganza this year. Um, I hope that you got some ideas for your own baking next Christmas. Here's a look at some of the trays that I put together. I just used some foil baking trays that I get at Costco and tried to layer everything in as neatly as I could, but we wrapped these up and gave them to friends and family and they really appreciated it. Um, I also had a tray to give someone that I wasn't gonna see for a couple days and so like with this one, I wrapped everything up in little cellophane bags um, and put it in the tray so that nothing would go stale. So that's it for today's video. Thank you again so much for watching. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this and that you use some of these recipes in your own home. I will see you in my next video. Bye.